from otherworldly humanoid creatures to spectral apparitions. I hope you enjoyed this collection of true horror stories, all set to the sounds of ambient rain. Some of these stories are brand new and others are a bit older, but none of them have ever been featured on this channel before. I'm Fearcrawler. Welcome to the video. I was 14 years old when I woke up in the middle of the night. It was storming badly. I woke up on the opposite side of the bed, which was very strange. I had a swivel chair in the middle of my room with the seat facing me. From where I was laying, it was straight in front of me. My bed was against the wall. When I woke up, there was a little boy standing behind the swivel chair. His lower chest and up is all I could see. He was wearing a white shirt and had dark short hair. He was moving extremely fast, and he was glitchy. He kept biting his nails and looking around like he was scared. I didn't think ghosts moved like that, like super fast. It seemed like he didn't notice me, but I had never seen him before. I sat up and turned on my lamp beside my bed and he was gone. I went straight back to bed. Usually I would scream or cry, but I did neither. I think maybe because I was so tired. He was my first and clearest apparition. So how did I wake up at the exact moment he was there? Plus, on the other side of my bed where my eyes were straight in front of him. I was in Pahong at that time celebrating my sister's wedding. All my family and relatives were present to celebrate this occasion. The band played traditional songs and compangs, though it's still a blast. During the wedding night when the ceremony or sanding was over, there was still some singing and feasting. It was held at a grass field not far from the bridegroom's house. It was then when my mom told me to accompany one of my aunts to the toilet. Now I had always admired this aunt, only 25 at the time, so tall and pretty. Now I had noticed almost all the guys, including the bridegroom and me, feast their eyes on her. So obviously I was happy to accompany her. You know, in Kampongs, the toilet is always at the back of the house and it's real scary at night. While my aunt was doing her business, I secretly started to smoke, looking at the surroundings. It is quite far from the crowd, but I can still hear the faint sound of music. It was very peaceful here. Until I heard my aunt scream from the toilet. I thought she saw me smoking, so I threw the bud immediately, cursing myself. She then ran out of the toilet. Her baja karang rolled up to the waist. What I saw behind the toilet wasn't a beauty, though. It looks like a man, but his whole body was black and shiny. It seems his whole body was covered in oil. It darted away in a strange manner among the bushes, and in a split second was out of sight. Before it ran out of view, though, I noticed its face, which I will never forget. It had red eyes and they were staring at me, just before it took off. This thing certainly wasn't human as no human moves like that. It reminded me of a spider, but with two legs. My aunt ran to me, catching her breath. I myself was scared, but still, I consoled her. We then went back to the crowd, and I told my mother about it. She too was shocked. One of the ladies on the bridegroom's side who overheard the conversation said it was an Orang Minyak, the oily man. The Orang Minyak is a ghost story, and this was no ghost. In the city where I live, there's an old water tower at the top of a hill near one of the parks. The water tower itself hasn't been used for more than 50 years, so it just kind of sits dormant. Let me try to describe what the building looks like. It's sort of a cylinder shape, not unlike a coliseum, and there are tons of alcoves and archways on it. The entire perimeter is surrounded by a fence, and as you would expect, there's also tons of no trespassing signs posted everywhere. There is electricity going to the site, because at night the sodium lights on the building light up. 
but from the road. They're almost invisible. And that's due to the fact that the entire site is completely surrounded by trees that have grown so thick and tall over the years that from the road, the building itself is almost completely invisible. The place had fascinated me ever since I was a kid. I always told my parents that I wanted to go there and just see what it looked like up close. But they always warned me that it was on private property and that it was clearly marked that you could not enter the site. Since I was just a child at the time, I of course respected my parents' wishes, but that all changed when I turned 20 years old and I was no longer living with my parents. I got the crazy idea one night that I was going to go up to the water tower, jump the fence, and just have a look around. Just kind of explore the property, you know? I want to state right now that I do not condone this type of activity. This behavior is entirely deplorable, and it's also illegal, and you definitely should not do it. And maybe by the time I get to the end of this story, you'll agree 100% with what I'm saying, and you'll understand clearly why I'm saying it. Anyway, I think it was a Wednesday night, or maybe a Thursday night. Not that that really makes a difference, but the reason I chose a midweek night was because I had a feeling that on the weekend, it was highly possible that teenagers would go there to try to drink, thinking that the place was secluded enough that they wouldn't get caught. In my 20-year-old mind, this seemed like sound reasoning, so I took that chance. I guess in a way it was just kind of selfish reasoning. I wanted to enjoy this experience alone, and I didn't want anyone to spoil it for me. And on this particular night, I did exactly what I said I was going to do. I went to the site around 10 o'clock, and I jumped the fence. My first impressions were a bit underwhelming. I don't know what exactly I was hoping to see, but in my mind, I just pictured it being different. Maybe more creepy, maybe better lit. I'm not really sure, I just pictured it being different. The lighting really wasn't that great there. Again, the place was illuminated by sodium lights, but they were old, very yellow and very dim. A few of them were even burned out. The good news about this was that it gave me lots of shadows to hide in. The bad news was, I didn't bring a flashlight with me that night, so I had to be extra careful where I was walking. I didn't want to trip and hurt myself. This was before cell phones became a really popular thing, so if I did get some sort of an injury like a broken leg, I was screwed. I hadn't been on the site for more than two or three minutes when I started hearing voices. Naturally, the first thing in my mind goes right back to what I said about teenagers looking for a place to drink. I thought maybe they were getting an early start on the weekend or something like that. But the more I listened to the voices, the more I realized that these weren't teenagers. The voices were much deeper, more mature, and had kind of a gravelly tone to them. My best guess was that these people were most likely middle-aged. I probably should have taken that as my cue to get out of there, but I got kind of curious, and I slowly made my way through the shadows to where the voices were coming from. After only a few moments, I could finally see where the voices were coming from. Imagine my surprise when I saw four figures standing about 40 feet away from me, inside of the fence line. They were far enough away and speaking quietly enough that I couldn't really understand the extent of their conversation. But I did pick up on a few key words that stood out to me. One of them was the word money, and the other was the word stuff. Even though these four individuals were quite a distance from me, there was just enough lighting that I could see money exchanging hands, as well as some bags. It was at that moment that it hit me that I was witnessing a drug deal. I did my best to stay quiet as I slowly worked my way back to the area that I had jumped the fence. At this point my heart was beating a million miles an hour and I started panicking. As soon as I got what I thought was a safe distance from them, I did my best to jump the fence in one clean move, but my shoelace got hooked, causing me to hit the ground with a thud as well as shake the whole fence. I immediately picked myself up and started running, and what happened next still gives me nightmares. I can hear shouting behind me, 
and two distinct pops as bullets whizzed past me while I'm running. At that age, I was actually a pretty fast runner, so I booked it for home as quickly as I could. I'd like to tell you that I called the police and that they caught these four guys, but that's not what happened. I didn't call the police. I was afraid of getting fined for trespassing, or possibly even arrested. I just thank God that I didn't get killed that night, because the probability of that was extremely high. So here's my advice to anyone that's into things like urban exploration. If it's private property, please just stay out. I absolutely could have gotten in trouble with the law for what I did that night, but I also could have lost my life. I want you to think about that. Enrique Rodriguez and a group of friends were outdoors in their hometown located just across Newark Bay from the New York City borough of Staten Island when they spotted something very strange. An alien ran to the left behind some trees and disappeared, Enrique reported. He described the entity as a tall grayish figure with long, large black brownish eyes, long arms and fingers. It had no mouth either, just the eyes. Rodriguez was at his friend's backyard when he saw it. The others became frightened and ran, but he just stood there looking, and the creature was looking back at him until it disappeared from sight. Enrique said that the entity had gray-colored skin resembling that of a dinosaur, very shiny, and was six to eight feet tall. He called the police, who scoffed at him, but did check the yard. Apparently, nothing was found. These events took place over the summer of 1998 while I lived in Boston. This particular summer was very rainy and there was quite a bit of flooding. The first experience happened one Saturday night while I was out with friends. We were traveling west along the Mass Pike during a downpour. I was seated in the back when I suddenly saw the lights from the passing cars had illuminated what appeared to be a man walking on the side of the road. From what I could see, he was an older man, and balding. He appeared to be in one of those wife-beater t-shirts and light-colored pants. He was also carrying something. This is the best I can describe him, given that the windows were blurry with raindrops. I mentioned to my friends that this was such a horrible night to get stuck on the side of the road. Interestingly, though, my friends didn't see the man. I kept waiting to see a car stalled with its hazard lights on but we didn't pass anything. I had forgotten about this incident until another night I was driving by myself during a rainstorm on the same highway, when what do I happen to catch out of the corner of my eye? The same man in the same clothes, walking up the side of the highway. There was no broken down car on the road either. There was a part of me that was tempted to go back and see if I could find the man, but there was another part of me that had a really bad feeling about this. This was an experience that would go on to repeat itself several more times throughout that summer. This didn't just happen on Mass Pike either. I had it happen while traveling on 495, and also on Route 2. It did not seem to matter if I had friends with me or not. I seemed to be the only person that saw this man, and he only appeared when it was raining. I don't understand why this was happening. He had no other discernible features other than what I just described. There were no deaths in my family or any other bad experiences that year. I had started to think of it as a warning of some sort, but I can't think of what it might have been. To this day, I still have no idea what the purpose of this was, and why I was the only one that was seeing him. This happened around four years ago when my car had broken down and I had to walk to work. I was working second shift at the time, and that meant walking home at around midnight every night. This really didn't bother me because the city was fairly safe. I lived in the kind of city where it was routine for the police to go up and down the business districts and check the locks on all the doors. Again, it was an extremely safe city. Almost nothing bad ever happened there. This was late October or early November, and the temperatures were starting to drop. On a couple of occasions when I was walking home, we even had freezing rain. I unfortunately had the bad habit of never properly dressing for the weather, 
because I never was the kind to plan ahead. So as such, I tried to get home as quickly as possible every night. One night on my way home, it was particularly cold, and I was only wearing a spring jacket. I was getting pretty good at navigating the city on foot at this point. I figured I could save about 15 minutes by cutting through a semi-wooded area. It really didn't seem like a bad idea at the time, and I certainly didn't think it was dangerous for me to do it. I figured worst case scenario would be I'd trip and sprain my ankle or something like that. But again, I was freezing and I just wanted to get home. So the thoughts of anything more dangerous than that really didn't enter my mind. After just a few minutes, I had worked my way through the wooded area and I could see pavement up ahead, which meant that I had found my way back to the road. My sneakers had barely touched the pavement when I saw headlights approaching. I of course thought nothing of this and continued walking. Within about 45 seconds, I could see that the vehicle that was approaching behind me appeared to be some sort of a tow truck. It was extremely rusty and very old, like something you'd see on a black and white TV show. At first I thought it might be one of the work trucks from one of the local garages, but as it drove past me, I didn't see any decals on the side that I recognized. The truck had gotten about 15 or 20 feet ahead of me when it slammed on its brakes. And I don't mean it slowed down. I mean the truck just came to a dead stop. To be honest, this did make me a little bit nervous, but I tried to ignore it and just continued walking. As I was just about to pass the truck, I saw the driver roll the window down and flick a cigarette butt out onto the road. The driver then stuck his head out the window and called out to me, saying something like, Hey you. I pretended not to hear him and kept walking, and then he hit the horn. My head quickly snapped around and I said, Yes, can I help you? The driver then exited the vehicle and walked towards me. When he got within a couple of feet of me, the first thing I noticed was that he stunk. He smelled like booze, and his eyes appeared to be extremely glassy and bloodshot. He looked me dead in the eyes and then pointed at the area where I exited the tree line. He then said, Do you know that you were trespassing? I said, No. I'm sorry, I had no idea. He suddenly looked incredibly angry. He got about three inches from my face and said, Don't lie to me. At this point I was completely freaking out. Something about this guy just seemed off and I had this strange feeling that he wasn't the property owner. My heart was pounding in my chest and I could feel my adrenaline coursing. The sensation was so strong that I thought I might throw up. Without hesitating, I started to run. I got off the road and made my way back for the tree line. When I hear the door of the truck slam shut and the vehicle start to accelerate, I backtracked through the woods and made my way back to one of the city streets. At this point, I was fairly confident that I had lost him. My adrenaline wasn't pumping as badly anymore, and I had calmed down significantly. I started making my way back home, minus the shortcut. I want to tell you that this is where this story ends, but it's not. By the time I was about three blocks from home, I see the exact same tow truck come speeding through one of the red lights in front of me and come to a sudden screeching halt not more than 15 feet away. It was like something out of a horror movie. How could this guy possibly know where I was going? There is no way in hell he could have followed me. I kept telling myself that this is not happening. I see this guy exit his truck and start walking towards me. I had just started to run when a police car suddenly pulls up and turns on its lights. Apparently, the officer had been parked in a parking lot across the street to monitor traffic when he saw this guy go through the red light. While the police officer was questioning him, I ran up to him and told him what had happened, that the guy had been following me. I later found out that the guy was under the influence of alcohol as well as narcotics, and that not only did he not own the land that I had crossed through, he didn't even live in that city. He also suffered from some sort of mental illness, and he had a criminal history. I definitely learned my lesson that night.
1. Don't take shortcuts home. It may not end in your favor. 2. Don't trespass. Don't ever. It's honestly not worth it. You never know who you might run into. At the same time that the area had suffered a blackout, the main witness was leaving the Sky Train Station when she noticed a large black square-shaped object moving low over nearby Slocan Park. Arriving at her daughter's residence, she heard a type sound outside. The two women investigated and saw a tennis ball sized blue light maneuvering over the area. At one point, it dropped close to the ground near the trees. The witnesses felt a warm sensation during the sighting. Later, the main witness felt compelled to go to the nearby park and found some strange marks on the ground. Upon leaving the park, she saw two short old people wearing jeans with rolled cuffs. They had pointy ears, glassy eyes, and were smiling as they stared at the witness. Apparently, she then received a telepathic message related to her sighting. When she turned around to look at them, the strange pair had disappeared. This happened to my grandfather and one of his co-workers. After one day, they decided to go and have supper at a new restaurant close to where they both worked. They were sitting in the restaurant and finishing their food when it started raining viciously. My grandfather suggested that they hurry home due to the heavy rain because he didn't want to push their luck with the storm. On their way to the house, they saw a girl in her early 20s standing beside the side of the road, hitchhiking. My grandfather could, and still today, still describe what she looked like. Dark brown hair, pale blue eyes, and she wore glasses. They stopped to ask her if they could take her home she agreed, got in the car, and gave them the address of where she lived. Eventually, after a long and confusing drive, they got to her house, lights burning inside and everything. She thanked them and got out and into the house. The next day, my grandfather and his friend were talking to one of their other co-workers about the terrible storm the previous night, and the poor girl they picked up in the rain. They then told him how they struggled to find the girl's house. The co-worker then asked where the girl lived. They told him the address and, seeing the guy's shocked and puzzled expression, they asked him what was wrong. The guy then said that the particular house belonged to a Portuguese family and had been burned down a few years ago, taking the life of the 23-year-old daughter who failed to get out of it in time. After this incident, the rest of the family, devastated by the girl's death, moved away, leaving the house and its remains behind. He said it was impossible for someone to live there again, because it was never rebuilt after the accident. Obviously, they didn't believe the story and decided to drive past the house again, just to make sure. And there the house stood, stained from burning, with no windows, no door, no roof, and no girl. My grandfather's friend got such a shock from this that he went into cardiac arrest, and they had to rush him to the hospital. It's weird, I know, but it's completely true. The following story was something that a friend of mine told me back when I was in high school. She swore up and down that the following story was 100% true, and to be honest, she never gave me any reason to doubt what she was saying. Obviously, this was a long time ago, and I don't have any supporting evidence, so take it or leave it. This is what she told me happened to her. One night during her freshman year of high school, she was spending the night over at a friend's house. They had spent most of the evening watching scary movies on television and ended up going to bed pretty late. At some point during the night, my friend was woken up by a strange sound. She sat up in the bed and started listening to it, trying to figure out what exactly the noise was. She said that at first what she heard sounded like a very low whisper, so she looked over at her friend to see if perhaps she was talking in her sleep. 
Upon observing that she was out cold and couldn't have been making the noise, she continued to sit up in the bed and listen to the strange sounds. As she did this, she noticed that the whisper began to change, not just in tone, but also the sound itself. The noise had transformed from the sound of a whisper to the faint sound of a baby crying. Since her friend didn't have any younger siblings, she thought perhaps that the sound was coming from a house next door. But as she looked over at the windows, she realized that they were all closed. Since the bedroom door was open, she thought perhaps the sound was coming from the downstairs. So she made her way out of the room to investigate. But as she made her way out of the bedroom and into the hallway, she noticed that the crying sound was more faint. And when she returned back into the bedroom, the sound grew louder. She sat back down on the bed and continued to listen. And she noticed that the longer she stood there and listened, the louder the baby's cries became. She said that she tried to go back to sleep and just forget the whole thing, thinking that perhaps it was just her overactive imagination from watching all the scary movies. But as she laid down in bed, she noticed that the sound got a little bit louder the closer she put her head to the pillow. And that was when she noticed a banging noise coming from the floorboards. She then knelt down on the bedroom floor, and she quickly realized that the baby's cries were coming from beneath the floorboards. Just as quickly as the sound started, the cries stopped. She didn't get back to sleep the rest of the night, and instead opted to stay awake until her friend got up in the morning. She didn't say anything about this event to her friend though, thinking that she'd probably think she was just crazy. It wasn't until several years later that her friend talked about the house she had grown up in, mentioning that she thought the place was haunted because of all the strange noises she would hear in the middle of the night. The only reason she shared this story with me and not her friend was because she knew how fascinated I was with the paranormal and how much I loved ghost stories. Again, I can't say whether or not this story is true, but I have absolutely no reason to doubt my friend and what she told me. So this is something that happened a few years ago to me and my friends. There used to be an old rundown house near where I lived. It's now been knocked down, but it used to be where the gated off bit was. As a bit of backstory, there were all these rumors that homeless people lived in it. The previous owner was murdered, it was a drug den, etc. So me and my friends were 16 and drinking and messing about on the beach and it was about 10.30. We'd ran out of beers, so my mate with the fake ID was getting more from the Tesco just up the road. When he got back, he mentioned the house and that it would be cool to go inside. We joked about it and made our way up to the house. To be honest, I didn't want to go in and was hoping there would be a door or something to stop us from getting inside. Unfortunately, I was wrong as there was no door on this house. We walked in and the first thing I noticed was the very strong smell of piss and there was dirt all over the floors. We went into the first room on the left which used to be a living room. There was the frame of a sofa which we could just make out due to the street light coming through. All over the floor was rubbish. Beer cans, crisp packs, syringes, etc. Now this should have been a sign to get out then as the house clearly wasn't abandoned. Anyway, we left that room and went into the kitchen, and it was a similar story. Shell of a room littered with rubbish. We carried on looking about the bottom floor until we got confident that it was just us. I was in the kitchen with my friend who was trying to get the fridge in there open, as it was fastened shut by God knows what. I refused to touch it due to how filthy it looked. He was making a fair bit of noise, whacking and scraping at the edges with a bit of banister from the stairs to lever it open. In between the noise he was making, we both heard a creaking sound upstairs and froze. 
We quickly went into the living room and saw that our other four mates were in there. By this point, I was panicked and terrified. We let our friends know what we heard and all agreed that it was time to leave. Everyone was trying to be brave at this point. We were walking out and we all heard another creaking. But this time, it was on the stairs. I was at the back turned around and could just make out a silhouette on the stairs. I then shouted something along the lines of, fuck, run, and we all sprinted out. We got out of the house, hopped the wall and were all waiting outside it, fixed on the door. A man stepped out of the house, turned back, and went inside. I don't particularly remember what he looked like, but he definitely didn't look homeless, and I didn't recognize him. Like a bunch of drunk 16-year-olds, we went back to the beach and started coming up with theories. Two of the guys were adamant that he had a knife in his hand, and that they could smell something rotting in one of the rooms, claiming he was a murderer, and one of us could have been his victim. Whoever he was, I still get chills thinking about it today, and I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. I moved to Denver about three years ago, in the fall of 1996. Anyway, the ghost in my house started to manifest itself in the winter of 1996. I woke up in my bedroom which is now the guest bedroom, by the way, because I refuse to sleep in it anymore, at about 1 a.m., and glanced over at my bedside. There was a black Persian-looking cat there, with its paws propped up against the bedside so that it was standing on its hind paws. I'll never forget the sight for as long as I live. Its body was only semi-solid, but it had completely solid yellow eyes. It was staring at me fixedly. I don't think that it was just a trick of light, because of three reasons. One, those eyes. Two, it moved slightly, closing its eyes and shaking its head in a very cat-like fashion. Three, I moved my head to look at it better, and it stayed the same. I started to scream and my father came into the room after about five seconds of this. I looked up for a second when he came in. I looked back down and it was gone. Me and my father conducted a very thorough search of the house and turned up no evidence of a cat either being there or getting in. After that, odd things started to happen. Only when I was there, as if it was selective, things that have happened. My cat's dish was mysteriously moved from the floor to the kitchen sink when no one was home. A gray scarf-like object quickly flashed in a deserted room. A white skirt-like movement accompanied by rustling, resembling a wide skirt. I heard footsteps in my parents' bedroom, slowly walking around their bed. My cat sometimes stares at a point in my bedroom late at night when no one is there, using a look I know when she is watching a threat. One night when I was in bed, I felt a hand quite distinctly on my head. I saw a white figure in the corner in a deserted room slinking gray cat shape out of the corner of my eye when I was at the computer. Things will disappear, and then when I check back in a place I've checked before, they are there. One night I heard something resembling footsteps walking slowly down the bedroom hallway, starting at the haunted bedroom, and stopping at my door for several minutes before moving on. Thankfully, it has a happy ending. A few months ago, I was sitting at the computer reading a story I had picked off the internet. It was about 10 at night and everyone else was asleep. Anyway, I felt a cold presence and was really freaked out. But this time, I felt like a prisoner in my own house whenever I was alone. Fear turned into anger. I got really mad and told the ghost to get out now and to never come back. Nothing actually happened that night, but after a moment of dead silence, my anger and courage left me and I ran upstairs to bed. I took my cat with me to bed. I fell asleep with the radio and lights on and the door shut. 
I had the most terrible time getting to sleep that night because I kept feeling presences. But whenever I felt anything, I would just tell it to go away. The most horrifying episode was when my cat actually stared at a corner of my bed and I had the most horrible feeling of something crouching there waiting to pounce. For about a week, the ghost seemed to gain strength. More things happened in that week than any other time. Then he just left. The last time I saw him was at about 6 in the morning. I had gotten up early to make myself some hot cocoa and was sitting at the kitchen table sipping a mug. To explain, my kitchen has two entrances, one to the bedroom hall on one side of the room, and the other is to the dining room and living room. The living room connects the two so you can walk from one door to the other through the kitchen without being seen from the kitchen. However, this takes a good five seconds. Anyway, so I'm just sitting there. I watch the door to the bedroom hall for no particular reason, and see a gray cat shape leap out really quickly and then leap out of sight. I smiled, thinking it was only my own grayish cat. But not even one second later, my own cat prances in through the other doorway. There was no possible way for him to get from one end to the other. I can only conclude that he was saying goodbye. Something else I think is related. When I am going up this one stairwell in my house, I feel this horrible heart-stopping sensation of fear. It feels as if someone is behind me. I don't know who. It's almost as if they want to kill me, and I have to get away. The danger feeling seems to emanate from a door at the base of the stairs leading outside into the garage. Sometimes when I run up the stairs from the fear, the feeling pursues you until about three feet away from the head of the stairs, where it stops immediately after a final burst. The fear is absolutely blinding, as if you are running for your life. I've asked other people in my house about that, and they've all noticed nothing. And another one, except in the hottest part of summer, when it is almost but not quite the same temperature as the rest of the house, the room I saw the cat spirit in is deathly cold. There's no explanation because it has the same amount of heating as the rest of the house. There are three thermostats in the house, one for the bedrooms, one for the living areas, and one for downstairs. Anyway... The living areas are always kept warmer in the house than the downstairs. Then the bedrooms are the coolest. But this room is frigid. Another not entirely explained phenomena was once about October of 1998, when I was trying to douse with a pendulum. I had it set to search for yellow, gold, or females. But once when I held it over a red object, it started to circle for no reason at all. It was completely reliable for everything else. I don't know the story of the house, but the most recent house owners were a young couple who remodeled it completely. Then there was an FBI agent, if I'm not mistaken. And then there was an elderly couple who lived in the house since it was built in the 1950s, until they both died of old age. I'm keeping a journal now on my computer of strange happenings. Anyway, the ghost is out. I will also be moving out sometime this summer. Everyone else in my family loves the house and never wants to move out, but I hate this house and can't wait to move. I still feel like the ghost is there waiting for me. I wonder about the next owners of the house and what they will go through. A couple of years ago, I had my first and so far only experience with the supernatural. For a little background, I live next to a canal, and at night I get light from streetlights reflected up through my window in that moving, watery way. I'm also a fairly heavy sleeper and hardly ever wake up in the middle of the night. It was a Thursday night, no different from any other. I was in bed asleep as usual when, guess what, I woke up. The way my bedroom was laid out, I had a digital clock facing me, so I know it was 2.36 a.m. I'm sure you know that in this kind of situation you realize that it's the middle of the night and take great pleasure in going back to sleep. I, however, felt odd. I cannot explain it any better than that. I simply felt odd. I was laying on my left side facing away from my door. As I laid there awake and a little confused as to what I was feeling, for no reason at all, 
I looked over my right shoulder in the direction of the corner of my bed and doorway, and there standing silently was what I can only describe as a monk. He was wearing the long robes with the cowl covering his bowed head. I was initially startled as you'd expect, but then I felt safe. I was not afraid. I had no desire to run because it did not feel at all threatening. It was solid, not misty or transparent, and I could see the way the reflected light feels on the contours of his robe. Then it was gone. No fading, just there one second, gone the next. I rolled over and fell seemingly instantly back to sleep. I have always believed in the supernatural and spirit guides, and as I am not religious, the closest thing to praying I ever do is to speak to my spirit guide if I am worried or stressed. It sounds funny, but speaking a problem out loud, even to what might just be an empty room, can be helpful in putting it into perspective. Could it be this acceptance and acknowledgement of my guide that allowed me this glimpse at this being who is working to help me in some way? That's all for today's video. I hope each and every one of you enjoyed this collection of stories. As usual, comments and feedback are always appreciated. So until next time, everyone take care, be safe, and above all, stay scared.